from the sea to outer space, few creatures have caused as much trouble or stopped as much trouble as the legendary Godzilla. The King of the Kaiju originally appeared in 1954 and has been a domineering media presence ever since. But not every Godzilla legend has survived as well as the giant lizard himself. We didn't kill it. Jesus Christ, we didn't kill it. On today's Lost Media Monday, we'll look at the history of some of the King of the Monsters' missing crown jewels. This isn't meant to be a comprehensive list, but I'm sure that won't stop people from telling me what I missed in the comments. There also isn't going to be much King Kong here, because I'm the Monitor Lizard and not the Monitor Monkey. So assemble the troops and grab your Gigons as we look at the Lost Media of Godzilla. Godzilla's first known lost media actually dates back to the character's first appearance. Not just his first movie, but the literal first time he shows up on screen. In the original 1954 film, Godzilla's debut on Odo Island originally showed the King of Monsters eating a cow after peeking over the cliff of a mountain. According to 2006 DVD commentary by Godzilla historians Steve Rifle and Ed Godzizewski, the scene was cut due to problems with scale. They explained that director Inashiro Honda and his crew had prioritized immersion and suspension of disbelief in their artistic vision, and felt the cow's presence in the shot would create concerns about the size of Godzilla. Whether they were worried that it would make Godzilla look too small, or raise questions about how the kaiju found the town's biggest cow on his first bite, the crew elected to remove the shots entirely from the final film. While still images of the scene have survived, it's noted that Honda, like many directors of the time, destroyed anything that went unused in a theatrical cut. This means that, realistically, the scene was likely gone before fans knew it was ever there to find it all. But thankfully, something does still exist to immortalize the first concept for Godzilla's first appearance. In May of 1995, Nintendo Power posted a preview for a game called Godzilla – Destroy All Monsters. Supposedly, the title was an English localization of Godzilla Kaiju Daikessen, a fighting game developed by Alpha Systems, which had been released in Japan for the Super Famicom in December of 1994. Kaiju Daikessen allows players to control Godzilla, Megalon, Mothra, three versions of Mecha Godzilla, and more as they battle against other kaiju. The game was a sequel to Godzilla Battle Legends, which was ironically created for the Turbo Duo, an American system, in 1993, becoming one of the console's best titles and only seeing release in Japan a year later. Destroy All Monsters received a middling review from Nintendo Power, who noted slow gameplay and a lack of variety, but American gamers of the time wouldn't be able to find out firsthand, as the game never released stateside. Interestingly, Nintendo Power stated the release for Destroy All Monsters was set for April, one month before the magazine was released, implying its delay and cancellation were extremely last minute. It's speculated this may have been due to the American failure of Super Godzilla, its Super Nintendo predecessor, or the upcoming release of the N64. But Super Godzilla released in America in May of 1994, months before Kaiju Daikessen even released in Japan, and the N64 wouldn't release until 1996, meaning neither makes sense for a last minute cancellation in April 1995. Ironically, Kaiju Daikessen would be the last Godzilla tournament fighter until Destroy All Monsters Melee, an unrelated title released on GameCube in 2002. Twenty twenty three's Godzilla Minus One proved to be the latest trailblazer in the historic series, finding worldwide success as a small budget Japanese film. While it earned the King of Monsters his first Oscar, it isn't the first Godzilla movie to find a surprise platform overseas. In March of 1977, the franchise's popularity convinced NBC to air one of its latest entries, Godzilla vs. Megalon, on television in its native Japanese. It would be the only time a Godzilla film was broadcast on American primetime in its original language. But of course, it came with a few twists. First, the film's runtime would be cut in half to fit into a one-hour time slot. And second, between each segment were live-action skits hosted by Saturday Night Live veteran John Belushi. Belushi came dressed in a full Godzilla costume, the same one he used in his previous parody of the character on SNL. According to reports, Belushi made a few jokes, threw a few chairs, and bit down on some movie reels. 
all the while making loose quips and references to the Godzilla franchise, including comparing Godzilla vs. Megalon to Godzilla vs. Rodon, a film that wasn't real then and somehow still isn't now. Printed news and historical archives detailing the event have survived, and people online openly remember seeing it, but no still shots or film from the Belushi segments have ever emerged. And given the bumpers aired five months before consumer VCRs were available in America, it's likely only NBC themselves is capable of tracking them down. Oddly enough, NBC's edit of the actual Godzilla vs. Megalon film isn't considered lost media. I'm not sure if that's because it's just a shorter version of a widely available film, or because it's somehow out there for people to find. But if you love looking smart in YouTube comments, now's your time to shine! Gareth Edwards' American Godzilla reboot released to theaters in May of 2014, but just two months later, he was already eager to let fans know what to expect for a sequel. At San Diego Comic-Con in July of that year, a pre-recorded message from Edwards introduced a trailer that told the world that Godzilla 2 was real and already in the works. It reportedly began with a speech from long-dead former President John F. Kennedy, who called for emergency meetings and disaster control as grainy footage and title cards revealed a cryptic message that Godzilla and the Mutos were not an isolated incident, and that there are other kaiju. Classic footage with the names Rodon, Mothra, and Ghidorah flash across the screen before a title card reads, Conflict inevitable. Let them fight. The trailer debuted in Hall H, and has never been seen outside of its four walls. In May of 2016, Edwards would leave Godzilla 2. Film would add the subtitle King of the Monsters that December, and would receive its first official trailer in 2018, before releasing the next year with director Michael Doherty. The film's sequel, Godzilla vs. Kong, would release in 2021, with its own follow-up reaching theaters in 2024. In the decade since the first trailer for the pre-King of Monsters Godzilla 2, its premiere has been well documented and even recreated by some excited fans, but it's never been released in any capacity, official or unofficial. It's unknown if any original assets were created for the trailer. Any pre-existing speech by Kennedy or specific shots used for the monsters weren't identified and Edwards has never been asked about the trailer since departing the MonsterVerse. While it's unrealistic to expect the release of a decade-old concept trailer for a film that ended up being made by someone else, it would be interesting to see. At best, it could represent one-of-a-kind lost kaiju content. At worst, it's like an old Toonami trailer. And those are cool, right? In May of 1998, an MMO based off Roland Emmerich's American Godzilla film was set for release on GameStorm, an online gaming service that gave players access to browser-based titles for a flat monthly fee. Basically, imagine if early Newgrounds could rob you. Developed by Mythic Entertainment and published by Emmerich's own Centropolis Interactive, work on the game was said to have lasted for over a year, with the title intended to launch May 20th when the film debuted in theaters. Things wouldn't go as planned though, with the game undergoing further work until November of 1998, when it would instead release alongside Godzilla's home video formats. The game itself allowed players to control one of four factions, a human military, human scientist, human photographers, and baby Godzillas, a race of the smuggest lizards I've ever seen. Modes included free-for-all, team deathmatch, escape, last man standing, and a capture the flag mode called Egg Statica. Computer Gaming World gave the game 2 out of 5, criticizing its stiff camera, its basic presentation, and summarizing it as a third-rate Diablo. GameStorm would be sold to EA in 1999, with the company closing down its servers in 2001. After this, Godzilla Online would be left unplayable, and while several assets and images still exist, the game itself has been lost to time. Adventure Godzilla Land. Wait, no, Godzilla Land? Godzilla Land. Adventure Godzilla Land was a series of children's shows created to promote the Heisei films across the 90s. The show's content featured musical numbers, trivia competitions, 
and aerobics exercises in both live action and super deformed style animated segments aimed primarily at young kids. The show would go on to broadcast two seasons, with its first airing in 1992 ahead of Godzilla vs. Mothra, and its second airing in preparation for Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2. Season 2 would even go on to be a landmark within the franchise, featuring the first on-screen appearances of Heisei's Mechagodzilla and Baby Godzilla. But in three decades, that single episode is the only one of the series to have been discovered. Godzilla and never received a home release, with the rest of the show still considered lost. Though given the widespread use of VCRs at the time, it's likely episodes of the show could still be found if the search gains enough awareness. While most of Adventure Godzilla and isn't available, the super deformed animated designs for its characters are taken from the long-standing Godzilla and merch line. Beginning in 1984, the line also branded the Get Going Godzilla and VHS OVAs, as well as the 1985 video game Godzilla-kun, ensuring fans can still see plenty of one of the series' more unique aspects. Batman Meets Godzilla was an idea that came as the result of extraordinary timing. Godzilla had recently seen a worldwide boost in popularity following an extremely successful 1962 crossover with King Kong, and producers were still looking for a sequel hook that would outdo it. Ideas ranged from a direct sequel that set up Godzilla and Kong for a rematch, to a crossover with Frankenstein's monster, and eventually, Adam West's Batman. Pitched in 1966, Batman Meets Godzilla would have pitted TV's most infamous take on the Cape Crusader against the King of the Monsters. How would it have worked? Well, it depends on who you ask. Two pitches were created for Batman Meets Godzilla, one from American writers and one from Shinichi Sekizawa, who had written King Kong vs. Godzilla, as well as its potential sequel. The American pitch can be found in the University of Wyoming's American Heritage Center. Its writer is uncredited, but its corrections and submissions come from Batman 66 showrunner William Dozier. In the 22-page treatment, Batman, Robin, Batgirl, and Commissioner Gordon take a vacation to Japan only to be confronted by Godzilla, who's being controlled by a German mad scientist. After watching the mind-controlled Godzilla decide not to attack Batgirl, Batman deduces Godzilla must be coming to the surface to… look for a mate? Notes in the script debate between mimicking the cry of Godzilla to lure him into a trap, or building a fake robot female Godzilla to seduce him, which I assume would have looked like Godzilla with a little bow on his head. Batman would capture Godzilla by detonating a bomb off of the side of his head, and then have Japan's citizens build a rocket around him, launching him into space where he would stay in orbit forever. Which, in a weird 60s Batman way, is pretty awesome. Batman? Yes, Mr. Wayne. If you're wondering about Sekizawa's pitch, well, so am I. As of 2024, the treatment has never been seen by the public. Reportedly, elements of the writer's work would end up in Son of Godzilla, released in 1967. Specifically, the idea of evil scientists and weather machines. Batman Meets Godzilla ultimately went unproduced because Dozier himself declined to make a sequel to the first Batman movie. The show would be cancelled after its third season following a drop in ratings, and both Batman and Godzilla would see a decline in popularity across the 70s before rebooting as much darker characters in 1984's The Return of Godzilla and 1986's The Dark Knight Returns. The idea of the two crossing over has never been seriously explored again in the years since. In 1989, copies of the NES game Godzilla Monster of Monsters, no that's not a typo, began including advertisements that made mention of a title starring the namesake of the greatest monster island czar, Rodon. Hey, yo, we represent the seeds of discontent, messianic millionaires. It was part of a lineup of released and upcoming Toho NES games such as Monster of Monsters, Circus Caper, Godzilla for the Game Boy, and Times of Lore, referring to its star as, quote, Godzilla's arch enemy though Rodon and the King of Monsters had only fought once and had been shown as friends since then. In September 1990, Rodon was mentioned in Nintendo Power 16, who called it a sort of sequel to Monster of Monsters, a game Rodon wasn't in, though fans would find the character in the game's files years later. GamePro also called the title a sequel during quick coverage that same month. 
but Rodon would never release or be officially cancelled. And instead, Godzilla 2, War of the Monsters, would debut as a North American exclusive in February 1992. The game began appearing in place of Rodon in Nintendo Power's April 1991 issue, and would be a firm departure from Monster of Monsters, going from a turn-based monster fighter to a strategy-based challenge game where players control the military to guide monsters away from the city. What changed between Rodon and the released War of the Monsters has never been elaborated on, nor has the change in name. While it's been mentioned that Nintendo Power attributed it to Toho feeling Godzilla's name would sell more units, the magazine never actually talked about War of the Monsters in depth, never giving it a review or even more than a quick mention outside of upcoming games lists. The King Kong that appeared in Edo is a landmark Japanese monster film released in 1938. It's considered a spiritual precursor to the kaiju genre as a whole, and ties back to Godzilla through costume designer Fumi Noriyohashi, who created the suit for the King Kong that appeared in Edo. The film's two parts, the episode of Transformation and the episode of Gold, were released a week apart on March 31st and April 7th. Each episode was reportedly about five reels long, though their exact time is unknown. The plot centers around the mysterious kidnapping of a woman and her father's attempts to ensure her safe return. Her kidnapper is the film's King Kong, who's never actually called that by name in the movie itself. The monkey monster acts as a henchman of the film's true villain, and was created without permission from RKO Pictures, rights holders of King Kong, though it's impossible to know if any legal action was ever taken by the company. The King Kong that appeared in Edo is survived by promotional material and stills, but the film itself is lost to time. Unsourced wiki rumors state that they may have been lost in the World War II bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which feels a bit too on the nose for the film that would inspire Godzilla. Monster Planet of Godzilla is the name of a 4D film attraction that appeared at Sanrio Puro Land and Harmony Land from March 18, 1994 through July 1, 1998. The film itself focused on the spaceship Earth, which is sent to investigate the disappearance of another ship named Planet. Traveling beyond the solar system to a world ruled by Kaiju, Earth comes across Mothra, Rodon, and Godzilla who are eventually transported to the Tokyo Space Station before Earth is able to escape. This is all common knowledge because the film itself has been available for years in the Japan-only Godzilla Final Box and the Japanese 5-disc DVD collection commemorating the 2014 Gareth Edwards Godzilla. At least, most of it has. While the film itself is readily available for fans digging into the depths of Godzilla's filmography, its home releases omit all appearances of the film's special guest star, Sanrio's Hello Kitty. Hello Kitty was part of the film's supporting cast, with Megumi Hayashibara, her most consistent Japanese actress, confirmed to have voiced the character. Hello Kitty's role in Monster Planet of Godzilla was reportedly that of a military general, likely part of the Japanese self-defense forces. It's speculated this may have been why her scenes were cut from home releases, but it may have also stemmed from rights issues. Monster Planet of Godzilla was able to use Sanrio characters in Sanrio parks, but including them as part of Godzilla releases may have proven a bit trickier. If the footage still exists, it isn't likely to leave Sanrio's vault anytime soon. Tokyo 1960 is the name of a lost Filipino kaiju film released in 1957. It's a localized adaptation of the first Godzilla, using Filipino actors to either reenact or create a new plot around Japan's existing footage to make the country's first known kaiju film. While it was advertised as being filmed in Tokyo, the new footage was shot locally in Manila across 1957. Tokyo 1960 first gained prominence online in 2008, with its existence confirmed as legitimate through recovered print ads. Cast and crew mentioned in promo material are also real, and even collaborated with the reported production companies prior to working together on Tokyo 1960. As of 2024, there's little doubt surrounding the legitimacy of the film, but there's also next to no hope of ever seeing it. According to the San Diego Filipino Cinema Group, most Filipino cinema is already lost, estimating that out of the 8,000 films produced in the country's history, only 3,000 survive. And while modern technology allows them to restore and preserve what they already have, it's not helping them bring back what's already gone. 
Barring any surprising developments, it means Tokyo 1960 is one of the many victims of its time. Another early lost Filipino kaiju film is Tuko Samadre Kaka, shot entirely in the Philippines and supposedly starring a giant gecko. Chibiko Special is the name of a Japanese Godzilla-themed stage and game show that broadcast for exactly 11 months on Tokyo 12 channel from October 24th, 1971 through September 24th, 1972. Reportedly, Chibiko Special focused on contestants creating original monsters, with a panel of judges offering feedback. The show featured original monsters, such as the show's mascot character Terra Incognito, but also featured Godzilla and several other official Toho kaiju such as Mothra, Gigon, and King Ghidorah. The series as a whole is considered lost media, but information about some of the lost episode's content is available. Suits used for the show's original characters reportedly appeared in Toho's 1972 action television series, Go Godman, though it's hard to know which one specifically without seeing the lost episodes. Most interestingly, Chibiko Special featured what could be the first appearance of any sort of Mecha Godzilla in Toho adjacent media. Mechana Godzilla was a design created by a young boy that appeared on the show. He had drawn a silver, mechanical Godzilla with a switch on its chest, which earned an in-show award for excellence. Reportedly, Nobuyuki Yasumaru, who would go on to co-create Mecha Godzilla, appeared as one of the judges. While Chibiko Special has never seen modern reruns or home release, its original broadcast began one month after the first consumer VHS was released in Japan, meaning home recordings of the episodes and potentially Mecha Godzilla's origin point could still exist. The Volcano Monsters was a planned American version of Godzilla Raids Again, the second film in the Godzilla franchise. More an adaptation than a translation, Volcano Monsters was planned to be its own movie, using its own plot and characters while lifting the VFX shots from GRA. The Volcano Monsters would have removed the kaiju identities and powers of its characters to make them more like giant dinosaurs, with Godzilla referred to as a female Tyrannosaurus and Angelus called an Ankylosaurus. Rights holders even received original Godzilla suits from Toho for planned reshoots, but plans fell through when the production studio went bankrupt just prior to filming, eventually deciding to redub Godzilla Raids again instead, releasing it as Gigantus the Fire Monster. According to Steve Rifle, the suit shipped for the Volcano Monsters would later be discovered by a crew working on insert shots for Invasion of the Saucer Men. Analyzing photos of the suits confirmed to be sent, Rifle also deduced they were different than the ones used for filming of Godzilla Raids Again. The Godzilla suit had no ears and a different number of toes, while Angelus had a different head shape than the suit used for the original film. It's possible they were created specifically for use in the Volcano Monsters filming, but special effects artist Bob Burns, who discovered the suits while working on Saucer Men, noted their poor conditions and signs of prior use, though this could have been the result of accidents during suit testing, or early attempts to film for Volcano Monsters. <laughs> 